I'm Aki Roberge, an astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. I'll speak to you today about the capabilities of possible future flagship observatories for studies of disks and young planets. From 2016 to 2019, I served as the study scientist for one of those mission concepts, LUVOIR, which you'll hear more about in this presentation. In January 2016, NASA started four studies of large astrophysics space observatory concepts in preparation for the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. These concepts were drawn from earlier community planning documents like the 2013 NASA Visionary Roadmap for Astrophysics and the 2010 Decadal Survey. So the four in alphabetical order are HABEX, the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory, Louvoir, the Large UV Optical Infrared Surveyor, the Lynx X-ray Observatory, and the Origin Space Telescope. So these images show the covers of the final concept study reports for all four missions, which were completed in August of 2019. So what's the difference between these missions? Let's start with wavelength. At the top, I've placed the wavelength ranges of some past, current, and upcoming large missions. So LYNX is an X-ray telescope primarily aimed at studies of high energy phenomena like massive black holes, circumgalactic halos, and supernova remnants. It can do highly valuable science on young stellar objects and stellar activity, but its exoplanet and disk applications are somewhat limited. Thus, I was not asked to discuss LYNX for this workshop, and that's the last I'll say about it. So next up is HABEX and LUVOIR. These missions span a similar UV optical near infrared band pass, much like the Hubble Space Telescope, which is sadly in safe mode at this time. Finally, we have Origins, which spans a broad band pass from the near to the far infrared. I'll start with Louvoir and Habex, covering the technical details of the concepts first, then moving to the science. So I've chosen to discuss these concepts together, uh, LUVEX as it were. Besides the similar wavelength range of these two missions, they have similar driving science goals, differing largely in the quantitative levels of ambition. Reflecting that, the instruments studied for the two missions are also similar in many ways. Since I'm most familiar with LUVOIR, I'll kick off with that mission concept. And as I go, I'll try to point out the key ways in which LUVOIR and HABEX are alike and how they differ. So beginning with a high level overview of LUVOIR, this is a concept for a powerful and flexible space telescope with very broad science capabilities. The LUVOIR team studied two distinct observatory designs. LUVOIR B at the bottom has a large eight meter diameter primary mirror and LUVOIR A at the top has a really large 15 meter mirror. Both have segmented uh, primary mirrors but LUVOIR B has an unobscured off-axis telescope to improve its performance for exoplanet science. Four candidate instruments were studied, which provide imaging and spectroscopy over a total wavelength range from the far UV to the near infrared. And I'll say more about the instruments in a moment. All four large mission studies assumed that mission development starts in 2025. Given that, we would expect LUVOIR to launch in the late 2030s. So we envisioned LUVOIR as a serviceable and upgradable facility lasting for decades with capabilities and operations driven by evolving needs. The prime mission duration is the usual five years with 10 years of onboard consumables at launch and a 25 year lifetime goal for the non-serviceable components. This movie shows deployment of the LUVOIR A observatory greatly sped up. In reality, the deployment sequence will take weeks. So as you can see, LUVOIR's design draws upon segmented deployable mirror technologies used in the James Webb Space Telescope, but has some distinctly different design features. For example, the LUVOIR Sunshade is far simpler than the JWST Sun Shield. The LUVOIR Sunshade has three layers compared to JWST's five, and more importantly, it does not require high precision positioning of the layers. So in a nutshell, the Louvoir shade is a parasol, not a thermos. 
I'll now briefly go over the four Louvoir instruments studied. So I want to emphasize that these are only a subset of the instruments that could be chosen for Louvoir, either in a first or a subsequent generation. So one of the observational challenges is to directly image faint exoplanets next to bright stars. Louvoir's solution to this is the extreme coronagraph for living planetary systems, Eclipse. This instrument features ultra high contrast capability, a very broad near UV to near infrared band pass, broadband imaging, and low resolution imaging spectroscopy using an integral field spectrograph. So while this is a challenging instrument, a huge amount of progress is being made through the technology demonstration coronagraph instrument on the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. The UV provides access to a wide range of atomic and molecular gases with temperatures ranging from a few Kelvin to 10 million Kelvin. Therefore, we studied the Louvoir Ultraviolet Multi-Object Spectrograph or LUMOS. This instrument provides multi-object, multi-resolution spectroscopy using a micro shutter array. It can obtain spectra of up to 180, uh, 840 objects simultaneously and spectral imaging of solar system bodies. The bandpass spans the far UV through the visible and there is also a far UV imaging channel. Now space-based telescopes can naturally provide extremely sensitive high resolution imaging over wide fields, uh, large fields of view. To take advantage of this, we designed the high definition imager HDI. This instrument has a near UV visible channel and a near infrared channel. The two channels can observe the same patch of sky simultaneously or operate separately for maximum sensitivity. HDI is also designed for astrometry measurements with micro arc second precision to enable measurement of exoplanet masses. So HDI, like all Louvoir instruments, can be operated in parallel. So for example, while Eclipse makes a long stare at an Earth-like exoplanet, HDI can produce an image four magnitudes deeper than the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So the fourth instrument, Pollux, was defined and designed by a consortium of 10 European institutions with support from the French Space Agency. This instrument complements the LUMOS instru instrument by offering high resolution point source spectropolarimetry over the near and far UV. I often summarize Pollux as an instrument to study magnetic fields everywhere. Uh, the conceptual instrument study could serve as a support for a future ESA contribution to LUVOIR. I'll now briefly go over the design features of HABEX. Most importantly, it has a four meter diameter unobscured primary mirror, which is a monolith that does not have to be deployed. The total wavelength range is a little smaller than that of Louvoir, but basically covers the same band pass. The HABEX team studied four instruments as well. <clears throat> the first is a coronagraph that is very similar to Louvoir's. HABEX also has a UV spectrograph and an imaging camera, both of which are similar to instruments on Louvoir. One difference is that the, uh, the HABEX workhorse camera does not have micro arc second astrometry capability like the Louvoir HDI instrument. So HABEX does not have a spectropolarimeter like Pollux. Instead, the last instrument is a near UV optical near infrared imaging spectrograph that is designed to work with HABEX's other starlight suppression system, the Starshade. And I'll say more about that in the next slide. With the same 2025 start date as Louvoir, the expected launch date for HABEX is in the mid 2030s. Uh, HABEX is also intended to be serviceable and has the usual five year prime mission duration with 10 years of uh, propellant. The HABEX team also considered eight other architectures um, with smaller apertures and other design changes. However, this four meter design represents the team's preferred architecture. So the other key difference between Louvoir and HABEX is that the latter incorporates two different starlight suppression system so, uh, for high contrast observations of exoplanets. In addition to the coronagraph, HABEX also has a star shade that is external to the observatory. It's like an enormous 52 meter diameter coronagraph mass that flies in formation nearly 80,000 kilometers in front of the telescope. 
That large separation lets the star shade suppress starlight while allowing light reflected by planets at small angular separations to, from the star to pass the shade and enter the telescope. So the star shade requires a propulsion system so that it can slew over large arcs to align with the next target star, as well as maintain alignment during observations. Those slews can take days to weeks. So the amount of onboard propellant limits the star shade to about 100 targetings before refueling is required. Uh, the advantage of star shades is that they are more sensitive compared to chronographs, partly compensating for smaller telescopes with less light gathering power. But chronographs do not require propellant separate from the telescope itself, and they allow faster and easier targeting. So in a nutshell, chronographs are nimble and star shades are sensitive, which is why HABEX does initial imaging surveys with the chronograph and spectroscopy with the star shade. So the star shade is a carefully shaped deployed structure that is launched separately from the telescope. Okay, now I'll turn to the science of Louvoir and HABEX. They will both enable an enormous range of science investigations spanning all the topics studied with Hubble and more. I'll briefly discuss the mission's key science cases relating to planet formation and evolution, starting with the driving goal of finding habitable exoplanet candidates and searching them for signs of life. While this may not seem directly relevant to young planets and disks, it is important for the topic of planet evolution, as I hope will become apparent. So several community reports going back more than a decade have expressed a general consensus about the search for life in the universe. First, that success in this search would be one of the major scientific achievements of the century. Second, that characterizations of exoplanets most like the only known inhabited planet, ours, will require direct spectroscopy from space. So LUEX will find habitable planet candidates in data like this. This is a simulated high contrast optical image of the inner solar system at 12.5 parsecs obtained with the chronograph on Louvoir A. Habix can obtain similar images for systems that are closer to the sun. The central star has been suppressed, revealing light reflected from faint planets in orbit. Jupiter is booming bright. Venus is visible just outside the starlight suppression region and its strange green color is caused by a correctable instrument artifact. And over here is the pale blue dot that we're looking for. So high contrast images will be obtained for hundreds of nearby well-known stars with Louvoir and dozens with Habex. The stars are mostly solar type FGK stars with some low mass M dwarfs and a few high mass A stars. For every exoplanet found that satisfies our definition of a habitable planet candidate, the missions will obtain preliminary characterization observations, including colors, orbits, and partial spectra. Then promising candidates will be followed up with deeper spectroscopy over a wider wavelength range to measure abundances and search for potential biosignatures. For both missions, pictures of fuzzy dots are not the real goal. We want to characterize the planets to see what they're actually like. So at 10 parsecs, <clears throat> Earth is a 30th magnitude object. That's about as bright as the faintest sources in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So we need powerful facilities to get high fidelity spectra of such targets. So this is a simulated spectrum of a modern Earth analog exoplanet observed in Louvoir's planned follow-up characterization program. Louvoir A, Louvoir B, and HABEX can all obtain such a spectrum, albeit with different exposure times. This spectrum has sufficiently high signal to noise over a sufficiently wide, 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 uh, wide wavelength range to measure key molecular abundances and not just detect a molecule or two. Uh, LUVEX will obtain also obtain detailed spectra of the host stars, especially at the important UV wavelengths that drive atmospheric photochemistry. So all of this 
is critical for obtaining the information you need to robustly identify biosignatures and rule out false positives. Okay, now we'll hopefully begin to see why I'm talking about habitable planets at this workshop. <clears throat> so Earth has had a global biosphere for most of its existence, and it hasn't always looked like the modern Earth. For example, earlier phasers, phases had lower O2 concentrations down to undetectable levels in the Archean Eon. Even ozone, which is extremely strong for modern Earth, is undetectable during the Archean. So the target stars in the survey will inevitably have a range of ages spanning all of these phases of the Earth. Uh, Louvoir and Habex were designed to find Earth's biosignatures throughout its inhabited history, as well as we know it. So this drove the broad wavelength coverage, which also provides the ability to find unexpected atmospheric constituents and other biosignatures. But Louvoir and Habex aren't just for Earth-like planets. Most planetary systems have multiple planets and many of which will be seen in the habitable uh, planet survey observations. So this plot shows the estimated yields of different kinds of exoplanets discovered with Louvoir A and B during the habitable planet survey. These range from rocky planets smaller and larger than Earth to gas-rich sub-Neptunes and Neptune and Jupiter-sized giant planets. And here are the expected yields for Habex. So in total, Louvoir A and B will find several hundred other kinds of planets during the habitable planet survey, while HabEx will find nearly 200. Again, these planets will have a range of ages, providing the opportunity to examine the evolution of planetary atmospheres in a statistically robust fashion. All of these planets will all be as bright or brighter than the modern Earth, and very high quality observations can be obtained. So a diverse set of observations will be possible for this huge range of planets, vastly expanding our fundamental understanding of planetary processes across a wide range of parameters. So cold to warm planets can be probed at near UV and to near infrared wavelengths with high quality, high contrast, direct spectroscopy. Uh, these simulated spectra were calculated for Louvoir, but similar observations are possible with HAPEX. The missions can probe the atmospheres of warm to hot exoplanets with transmission spectroscopy from the optical to the near infrared. The quality of the spectra will far surpass that of current HST transit spectra. And Louvoir transit spectra will also likely surpass the quality of JWST transit spectra at the overlapping wavelengths. And finally, LUVEX transit spectroscopy in the far UV will have the unique ability to measure atmospheric escape rates for very hot evaporating exoplanets. Uh, this will help to connect the observed atmospheres of mature giant planets to their initial composition and formation. Okay, now moving back in time to the actual formation phases of planetary systems. The history of a system is encoded in its arrangement of planets and planetesimal belts which we can trace through interplanetary dust. For the solar system, we have this information and it provides important clues to the late stages of planet formation and the dynamical evolution of our system. If we can observe other systems with high fidelity, we can test whether similar processes operated elsewhere. So this is a model of the solar system, including planets and interplanetary dust coming from comets and asteroids. The planets imprint their gravitational signatures on the dust, creating fine structures like uh, this partial gap carved by Neptune. Eclipse high contrast imaging can sensitively map the structure of warm inner dust at high spatial resolution, even for old systems. And ALMA will image cold Kuiper belt dust in many of the same systems. So together, we can obtain a complete picture of the arrangement of planetesimal belts in mature planetary systems. As in the solar system, this will place constraints on the formation locations of planets and their early dynamical evolution. 
Okay, so the last piece in the dynamical history puzzle is masses and orbits for all the planets in the system, even down to terrestrial planets. For larger planets, their minimum masses can be measured with ground-based radial velocity observations. LUVEX will measure the orbital inclinations and provide the actual masses. So the limits of future ground-based RV are yet to be determined. To ensure measurement of masses for terrestrial planets and all planets in face-on systems, the LUVOIR team included a high-precision astrometry mode in the HDI instrument. So while this feature may not be feasible for HABEX, it is possible that ground-based RV using the future extremely large uh, ground-based telescopes will eventually provide masses down to earth mass around sun-like stars. So thus, LUVOIR can provide powerful information on planetary system architectures that's needed for high fidelity dynamical modeling. And HABEX can do the same with some help from the future ground-based ELTs. Okay, and now we turn to an even earlier phases of planet formation. So the bulk of the mass in protoplanetary disks is molecular hydrogen. You'll hear more about the importance of H2 later when I talk about the origins mission concept. Um, the fact that this is a light molecule with no permanent electric dipole moment makes its rotational and vibrational transitions very weak. And H2 is notoriously hard to observe in a mission. Some have called it the dark matter of planet formation. However, the electronic transitions of H2, which lie in the far UV, are strong. Absorption spectroscopy at far UV wavelengths can sensitively measure H2 at a wide range of temperatures. So in addition, many strong lines of other important molecules lie in the far UV, including water, which is critical for habitability as we know it, and is hard to observe from the ground. The LUMOS and UVIS instruments can obtain these important spectra for protoplanetary disks with the primary goal of directly tracing the dissipation of primordial disk material and better establishing the time scales for planet formation in different stellar environments. So most importantly, they were designed to do it efficiently via multi-object spectroscopy. The instrument's micro shutter arrays will allow observation of up to hundreds of objects simultaneously. So also the, the shorter minimum wavelength of the LUMOS instrument on LUVOIR was largely chosen to allow observation of the important coldest H2 lines. So in addition to providing the critical far UV wavelength coverage needed for H2, the instrument's multi-object capability is truly revolutionary. <clears throat> a single LUMOS or UVIS map of a dense area like the Orion Nebula cluster provides a larger and higher quality data set than the entire medium resolution UV spectroscopic archive of protoplanetary disks from three decades of HST observations. Okay, finally, another important science case for LUVEX is observing the accretion of young protoplanets embedded in protoplanetary disks. This accretion produces shocked hydrogen emission in the optical H alpha line and excess continuum emission at UV wavelengths as seen in these uh, images obtained with Hubble. So while the H alpha line is accessible from the ground, the UV continuum emission actually provides better measurements of mass accretion rates, making it a valuable complement to ground-based observations. <clears throat> So in sum, both LUVOIR and HABEX can make transformative contributions to our understanding of exoplanets, planet evolution, and planet formation. Okay, now for the origins mission concept. So origins has a 5.9 meter obscured primary mirror, which is segmented, but not deployed. It spans a very broad band pass from the near infrared to the far infrared. So the key feature enabling the long wavelengths is the very cold telescope temperature, 4.5 kelvins, compared to JWST's 50 kelvin temperature. The overall mission architecture is far more similar to that of Spitzer than it is to JWST, with a barrel and two cylindrical uh, sun shields, or a two-layer cylindrical sun shield. So this sun shield uh, does have to deploy on orbit 
but in a far different fashion from Webb's. The team studied three instruments, which I'll briefly go over in the next slide. So like HABAX, the expected launch date would be in the mid 2030s and the observatory is serviceable. Also like uh, LUVEX, it has a five year prime mission duration with 10 years of consumables at launch. Okay, so the first instrument is the Origins Survey Spectrometer, which appears to be the workhorse instrument used for many of the observatory science cases. Uh, the specs are on the slide for your future reference. The Far Infrared Imager Polarimeter provides imaging with polarimetric capability at two wavelengths, 50 and 250 microns. Uh, this instrument is primarily intended for extragalactic science. And finally, there is an instrument designed for exoplanet transit spectroscopy. Uh, this was designed via a partnership between NASA Ames Research Center and the, and the Japan Space Agency. So the Origins 5.9 meter telescope is a little smaller than Webb's 6.5 meter primary, but achieves better sensitivity than Webb at wavelengths longer than about 18 microns thanks to improvements in detectors and in cryocoolers. At far infrared wavelengths, Origins is an impressive 1000 times more sensitive than the Herschel Space Observatory and SOFIA. <clears throat> okay, so these are the three main science themes for Origins. How do galaxies form, make metals and grow supermassive black holes? How do the conditions for habitability develop during the process of planet formation? And how common are life-bearing planets around M dwarf stars? Theme two is very much focused on protoplanetary and debris disks, making origins an important facility for studies of these objects. So a key goal for origins is to follow the trail of water from protostars to protoplanetary and debris disks and into the solar system. <clears throat> so Webb will access the warmest water transitions while Alma's ability to observe water vapor is limited by Earth's atmospheric transmission. Origins, on the other hand, has access to many lines of water vapor across a wide range of temperatures. So that capability will allow origins to probe water in many parts of a protoplanetary disk. <clears throat> the emission in these lines will not be spatially resolved, but by combining information from many of them with advanced disk models, a picture of the disk temperature structure and water distribution may be constructed. Some particularly valuable lines will be spectrally resolved into double peaked profiles, which will provide separate information to help constrain the location of the emission. <clears throat> so thus, LUVAR would provide sensitive measurements, not LUVAR, origins <laughs> would provide sensitive measurements of water in about a thousand protoplanetary disks within 400 parsecs, enabling an enormous advance in our understanding of how water and other volatiles are incorporated into planets. Okay, so moving now into the late stages of terrestrial planet formation, debris disks contain small amounts of gas as well as dust. So like the dust, the gas comes from destruction of young planetesimals, but is unfortunately far less well studied. Since the low densities of debris disks make them optically thin to dissociating radiation, the bulk of the gas appears to be atomic and ionic. <clears throat> For a small handful of debris disks, the Herschel Space Observatory detected neutral oxygen and first ionized carbon emission, which appear to be the most abundant gases in these disks. These same emission lines are accessible with origins with much higher sensitivity. So these lines cannot be observed with ALMA, although that facility does provide access to neutral carbon and carbon monoxide, which is the only molecule observed in debris disks to date. So <clears throat> origins can provide the missing pieces to enable measurements of C to O ratios in about hundred debris disks. So this is a key abundance ratio that will permit 
inferences about the abundance of water and other volatiles in the parent bodies, which may provide life critical materials to terrestrial planets formed inside the snow lines of these disks. On that note, <clears throat> the question of what bodies delivered the water that makes up Earth's oceans has been plaguing scientists for a considerable time. The deuterium to hydrogen ratio in Earth's ocean water is marked with the horizontal line. It is much higher than the value inferred for the pre-solar nebula, but it lines up reasonably well with the ratio in chondrite meteorites. So this has been taken as evidence that outer belt asteroids were the primary source rather than comets, which tend to have higher ratios. However, there are few measurements of D to H, H ratios in asteroids and comets, and there's considerable scatter within those few measurements. <clears throat> in two particular comets, the measured D to H ratios are actually fairly similar to that of Earth's oceans. Okay, so via observations of H2O and HDO emission lines, Origins can measure the D-to-H ratios in more than 100 solar system comets, far more sensitively than Herschel or ground-based facilities. So this will greatly improve our knowledge of the D-to-H abundance pattern in solar system planetesimals. Uh, it will also provide more precise information on their formation locations. So all of this together will hopefully reveal which specific population or mix of populations delivered Earth's water. Okay, so <clears throat> the total initial mass of a disk is probably the most fundamental parameter for the planet formation process. But as you heard earlier, most of the mass is in molecular hydrogen, which is extremely hard to observe in emission. Total disk masses are typically inferred from either observations of dust emission or carbon monoxide. Both of these are minor contributors to the total disk mass, and there are other pitfalls with bootstrapping to total disk mass using this, these tracers. So all the surveys find that dust estimated and CO estimated disk masses often differ by factors of 10 to 100. So while uh, origins will also struggle to directly measure H2, but, uh, but the observatory can observe HD and that should be a much more accurate proxy. So origin's high sensitivity will allow it to survey 500 protoplanetary disks for HD emission. The expected uncertainties in total disk masses should be greatly improved to factors of only two to three. And this will permit far more accurate modeling of planet formation and possibly reveal new insights into the process. Okay, so finally, I will say a little bit <clears throat> about origin's science theme three how common are life-bearing planets around M dwarf stars. So origins can study potentially habitable planets around low mass stars with mid-infrared transit spectroscopy, which is well suited to these targets. While this may not be directly relevant to young planets and disks, it is complementary to the reflected light spectroscopy of potentially habitable planets around sun-like stars that I discussed earlier. So the origins team strategy is to start from a set of at least 28 temperate terrestrial planets orbiting late K to late M stars that were previously discovered with other transit survey missions like uh, TESS. Similar to Louvor and Habex, <clears throat> the strategy involves down selecting the most promising objects for more and more detailed follow-up. Step one is preliminary shallow transit observations aimed at CO2 to tell whether these planets have cloudy or clear atmospheres. Next, origins will perform eclipse spectroscopy of roughly the 14 planets with the clearest atmospheres, orbiting around the smallest mid to late M dwarfs. And this will allow assessment of the planet's surface temperatures. And then finally, deep transit spectroscopy of the 10 best targets will be done to look for potential biosignature gases. So <clears throat> Webb will likely execute similar observations for a few potentially habitable M dwarf planets. Origins has a slightly smaller telescope aperture, 
So how will its observations compare to those of Webb? So this figure shows simulations of Webb and Origins transit spectra calculated by the Origins team. They both assume 60 transits of a modern Earth twin planet orbiting a bright M8 star. Despite the smaller aperture, Origins is expected to provide better quality data, in this case, thanks to improved detectors rather than the colder telescope temperature. In the modern Earth, <clears throat> ozone and methane are produced by life, and they could not exist in the observed concentrations without it, making them valuable biosignature gases. The same is true for ozone and N2O. However, I do want to emphasize that no one molecule or pair of molecules are automatically a biosignature in every situation. The whole planetary and stellar context matters. So for all three missions, the planned observations are the beginning, not the end, of the search for life outside the solar system. So I've gone over many of the exciting science drivers for Luvoir, Habex, and Origins. And these represent truly transformative science that would change the whole field of astronomy, just as an earlier generation of great observatories did. But powerful general purpose observatories like these would have the ability to do science investigations we haven't dreamed of yet. And that is perhaps the most exciting thing about them. So thank you. And I look forward to seeing you at the workshop.